Hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews from an Undisclosed Location. I'm still your host, Mark Papiani. Undisclosed Locations is a series of podcasts produced by the John Cotton Dana Library at Rutgers University. In this series, I will be talking with my colleagues and co-workers discussing their positions and jobs at Dana Library. We'll also get a little bit into their personal lives, if, of course, I can coerce, and they will indulge. Drinks depend on the time of day, and conversations may get a little in-depth or may stay flat on the surface, and there's always a chance for a few laughs, but don't hold me to that. Today's guest is Elizabeth Searles, Senior Archivist at the Institute of Jazz Studies at the John Cotton Dana Library. Elizabeth Searles, welcome to uh, Interviews from an Undisclosed Location, and you obviously are in an undisclosed location because... That is not where you are. Is the map of uh, Harlem? You say it is behind you. Anyway, let, let, let's let, let's start off by saying, Elizabeth, how are you? Good to have you on the show. And um, how's everything going? Well, hi, Mark. Thanks for having me today. Things are going great. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you right now? I mean, no, I shouldn't ask that because this is undisclosed locations. Uh, <laughs> I can disclose the location. That's okay. It's not a big deal. I'm actually at the library right now. I kind of thought that you were. Yes. How's that feeling being uh, being back at the library? Well, um, immediately when I came back, it was overwhelming because my office is such a mess. <laughs> and I got used to working in my office at home was very clean and tidy. Oh. My office in the library is not very clean and tidy. I've been at your office many times at the library and you have one of the more tidier offices considering the uh, your close proximity to the uh, neighbors next door. Indeed. Um, <laughs> I didn't even know who we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I actually, I, I like being back. Um, it's been difficult to assist our users remotely when they have questions that relate to our collections. So being able to access the collections is is helping us um, continue to provide services to people who want to use the Institute of Jazz Studies. And I also like the change of scenery. And I, you know, I miss my colleagues and there's some of us back in the building. So it's nice to just say hi as I'm passing by, you know, well in, in the distance, of course. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, who are listening, who aren't familiar with your position, what what are you actually doing? You're in the Institute of Jazz Studies? Yeah, I work at the Institute of Jazz Studies. My title is archivist. Um, so I deal with the Institute's archival collections primarily, but uh, I work with other collections too. Mm -hmm. um, we have 317 archival collections at the Institute. So it's a, a lot of different kinds of things. Okay. How long have you been there now? I've worked at the Institute since January 2014. Yep. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, you just got tenure. Is that correct? I got tenure this year, indeed. You did? Congratulations. Thanks. How do you feel? Um, I feel tired. It was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> tired? Well, now, now you shouldn't feel tired now. You should feel relieved now. You should feel uh, like a, a sense of accomplishment. You should feel... Uh, well, as, <laughs> as our friend Vinny puts it, I'm tenured. What are you going to do? Fire me? <laughs> I also feel really grateful because, um, I got so much support from everybody at Dana and could not have succeeded at getting tenure without everybody around me here in the library and at Rutgers libraries, um, and on campus. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I feel really grateful also. Okay, good. Good. You anticipate a long career there? Yes, I'm going to work here as long as Vinny has worked. Actually, I don't know if I can because he started working here when he was younger. Oh, oh I thought you were going to say as long as Vinny's here, as long as Vinny has been there. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, he started kind of young, like at 16, I, 17. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. And he's, what, how old is he now? About 84? <laughs> 93. <laughs> 93. Yeah, so that's that's quite a number of years. Um, but you're you're young still. You got lots of time. You got lots of time. 
No, I look forward to being of service to the Institute for many years. Um, it's really a treasure in the world, and it's it's really an honor to be able to work here with the collections and help our users. Um, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I'm not I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay, good, good. We like having you here. Well, thanks, Mark. I, like you here. <laughs> I mean, for what it's worth. I mean, for coming from me. <laughs> So what is it that you're actually doing with um, uh, you're back at the back to the library now, back at the Institute of Jazz Studies? I know Adriana, I believe, is uh, there also. Um, yes, Adriana and Diane and I are the three people at the Institute of Jazz Studies who are back in the office. And how are you uh, working out uh, serving serving people with uh, questions with, with with reference and so forth? They come to you qu with questions, or they call up, or how is that working out now? Um, well, we have been getting some phone calls. Um, like I got a call yesterday from some guy who wanted to know if we scan things for people and he just had some family, personal family photos that he wanted to have scanned. And I had to tell him, sorry, that's not the kind of service that we provide, but there's lots of commercial service providers who will gladly scan your family photos for you. Does but, uh, it, was it, was it a jazz, uh, no, uh family or no, just, just out of the guy. He wanted to know if we had scanners that he could use well, <laughs> if we were open. So well, at one point, sorry, uh, but we can't help you. Oh, um, but no, we get most of our questions via email. Um, some people call, but mostly email these days. And so they either come to us directly or they go through our website. Um, and then Vinny is the person who kind of divvies up the questions and we take turns answering them and and he'll he'll direct questions you know depending on because he's not working on site so he'll give questions to me or adriana or diane that require um actually using the collections here at the institute mm -hmm. okay but um so you've just got the two people in the department so you have that entire floor for yourself right now are you you're not interacting with other people on the other floor is it like a ghost town up there or anything or, or what? yeah it's pretty much like a ghost town um you know say, like i said i say hi to people on my way up from a distance wearing my mask um <laughs> and you know chris has been up here a couple times because he helped us set up a digitization station the scanner the epson scanner that we used to use is set up now so we have access to that again which is great and i really appreciate that he did that um so otherwise you know i kind of say hi to diane we've been having meetings online even though her office is just a couple floors down we, we meet online because we're not supposed to you know be communicating in person keeping social distancing um rules well, uh, as cool. possible yeah and um so uh, the digitization—that's a difficult word. Digitization projects. <laughs> well, I, I was working on that uh, a little bit with you guys. Uh, is this back in the sound lab, or are you doing it at your office right now? Or um, no, we're actually we're digitizing paper materials like oh, oh. You know, photos, correspondence, music, books. Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Is there we're any not doing any audio digitization? Is there well, any? Any particular collection that you're working on, or is it? Um... Well, most recently, um, I scanned. I personally scanned some uh, an article from Downbeat Magazine for a graduate student in the Jazz History and Research Program here at Rutgers Newark. Mm -hmm. And um, Diane uh, helped me with a request for some materials from the Marshall Stearns papers that she scanned. And uh, you know, I've been looking at stuff in the Mary Lou Williams collection for another user, so. Mm -hmm. Lots of different things. Um, I think more people might be familiar with uh, Count Basie, and we just account or the institute just acquired the uh, the entire Count Basie collection. Are you involved in uh, any uh, aspect of that? Yes, I am all over the Count Basie collection. So uh, <laughs> earlier, one of my projects while I was working remotely was to write a grant to the New Jersey State Historical Commission. And hopefully they'll give us some funding so that we can um, work on processing the archival papers of the collection. Um, Cause it's, it's a fairly, sub it's, it's one of our biggest collections. It's going to be a lot of work and we need some extra support. 
Um, we should find out in October if that grant was successful and we're still waiting also to hear on another grant application we applied for to do some conservation work on the artifacts because the largest part of the collection are the artifacts. Um, we basically got the contents of the Basie's home um, when he died at the time of his death, more or less. Wow. So it's, that, you know, it's that everything from... What'd you say, Mark? I was going to say that has to be a huge amount of materials. If you... Yeah, it's it's gargantuan. <laughs> <laughs> Comparatively, I mean, I mean, the institute has uh, Benny Carter collections. They have the Mary Lou Williams collection. How would you how would you rate this uh, Count Basie collection in there as far as volume goes? It's our biggest one. It's the biggest one. Jeez. Yeah. And it's not just yeah. it's not just manuscripts and recordings. We have. No, I would say I would say it's more art. Like the artifacts actually take up more space than the papers because. You know, we've got stuff like his, we have his organ, we have his piano, uh, one of his pianos, we have um, his motorized scooter, we have, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it's like, I think we have the, like, speakers that he had out by his pool in the Bahamas because he played music in his yard, I, you know, it's, it's all over the map. <laughs> <laughs> that along with uh, a lot of his wardrobe. You know, the famous oh, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. lots of shoes, hats, shirts, robes. Um, robes? We, but, you know, we also have, you know, we have his Grammy Awards. We have his home movies. We have. Oh, that would um, be great to see. We, you know, we've got his scrapbooks. There's this really awesome notebook from the 30s that kind of log all the places that the Basie Band played. And it, it lists all the band members. And what he paid them for each gig. Yeah. And then and then he lists the expenses and he lists the revenue so he can keep track of how much money they're making. I mean, there's real treasures in this collection. And it also includes um the papers of Catherine Basie, his wife, who people need to know about. She isn't as well recognized as Count Basie, obviously, because she wasn't out front and center, but um they met because she was a dancer um in the cotton club and she, uh, you know, they got married and had a daughter, Diane, but um, she was very involved with the with civil rights organizations and a lot of activist um, activities. And so there's a lot of that documented in the collection also that I think will be really interesting to researchers when we finally get it processed. Now, if I wanted to see some of those home movies, uh, just a, as a personal thing, or, I mean, just so I can educate myself, uh, what's the, is there a process for that, or is that uh, readily available for somebody like me, or well, anybody yeah. else who just you know, like the gentleman who called yesterday and wanted to do some scanning, didn't couldn't get his scanning in, but you, but he says, oh, we've got some Count Basie movies. Would you like to see those? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, well, it's not quite that easy because um, we haven't well because the collection isn't processed. We haven't previewed all the footage. I mean, one thing that was great about the collection is that all the movie footage was digitized before the Institute acquired everything. Okay. So fortunately, we don't have to do that work, um, which is, it requires a lot of resources um, to do that. So we're really lucky that it came already digitized, um, but we haven't had a chance to go through it all and kind of inventory it. So until that happens, it's not really completely available for you to use. But but if you wanted to take a look at it, um, if you would like a specific idea about what you wanted to look at, um, we might be able to help you. I used a little bit of it in a presentation I gave on New Jersey Jazz Resources at the Institute. And um, there was footage of Basie and the Basie Orchestra at the um, New York World's Fair in 1964. Thank you, 1964. And uh, it was before you were born. <laughs> what did you say? That's before you were born. Yes, yes, it was. Um, <laughs> but uh, you could see the Basie Orchestra playing in the singer. I think it was the singer like field or something. And then he also um, they had a exhibit where they kind of recreated the Chinese theater in Hollywood and the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And they had Basie like put his hands in the cement. Oh, the Grauman's you theater? Know. Yeah. Oh yeah, thanks, that's what it's called. Yeah. And um, and then there was like a New Jersey exhibition hall and he was 
featured there. So we have some footage of that. One thing that's kind of interesting about Count Basie is that he adopted home movie equipment really early, like right after it became available, he bought like a, a camera and he taped everything. I mean, it's really, it's it's just, it's really sweet footage because you can see the family like celebrating Christmas and just kind of relaxing at home. And, um, and I, I don't know, it's, you don't get a, it, it almost feels voyeuristic to watch it. It's like their private family yeah. footage. So, well, I mean, nowadays it's so readily available for anybody to pick up a cell phone and start recording anything, or, you know, we do have video cameras and so forth. Back then it was a very much of a novelty. So we don't, we didn't get to see everybody's, you know, um, it was only the people who uh, uh, could afford it, had the time and, and the leisure, uh, leisure, leisure time to, to do things like that. I know my father used to record, you know, do some home movies and stuff like that. My other, my uncle used to photograph everything all the time, all family events. And that's why I can, I think I have one of the better memories of, of my family because I remember all those and I can re refer back to the film, the films, the movies and so forth. Uh, so I remember those times. And, um, but nowadays everybody just takes it for granted that, you know, you could pick up a cell phone and start recording and they're not living in the moment. They're miss They're missing so much of, of what's going on in, in their lives that um, they're just too preoccupied with trying to, you know, immortalize it on their phone. Well, you know, as an archivist, I always think, where are those videos and photos going to end up? Yeah, exactly. And like, for what per are like, is, is somebody going to use them someday? How, what, you know, well, it's, that's, it's interesting to think about to think about how people kind of capture their own archives. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, why and what to do with them. I mean, uh, uh, I've been trying. I mean, <clears throat> I'm nowhere near as famous as Count Basie, and don't ex ever expect to be. But I do want to preserve some of the legacy of myself and my family and my ancestors. So I do have lots of photographs and lots of films and videos, and you know, I'd, I'd like my children's children's children to be able to, you know, see what was going on in, in our lives. So I'm trying to compile that stuff. But as far as other people, they just keep it on their phones. I have friends who are like, oh, I, I, I got to get a new phone, but I have 3,000 pictures on here and uh, I don't know what to do with them. I guess I'll just lose them. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Some people think like that, you know, li again, living in the moment, if it's it just take the picture, throw it on social media and they think it's going to be there forever. Well, speaking of pictures online, I did want to mention bringing it back to Count Basie. Sure. There's a couple things coming up that people might be interested in. If anybody listens to this interview, we <laughs> are developing an audience. Yeah. <laughs> we well, yeah, and, and that's what I'm going to ask you to do too. Once this is done, you need to share the information. You need to share your interviews and put it out there wherever you can. So oh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna send it to my mom and dad. Yep, yep. Public relations um, marketing. That's what we need. No, what I was gonna say is uh, there's a couple exhibits coming up using materials from the Basie collection. Um, one we're doing in partnership with the Grammy Museum out in LA. It's going to be an online exhibit. Because they um, they had a physical exhibit with stuff from the collection before the institute acquired acquired everything, mm -hmm. so they're they're making that digital, and we provided some additional scans from the institute for that. So that'll be online, and I think that's going to launch. I don't know, maybe by the end of the month, and then in September at the T. Thomas Fortune Center in Red Bank, which is Count Basie's hometown, right, where the Count um, Basie Theater is. Yes, uh, the T. Thomas Fortune Center is going to have um, an exhibit, and they're going to borrow a few a few actual artifacts from the collection. I mean, we didn't give them a Grammy or anything like that, but um, they're going to they're going to have some stuff from the collection on display and, and celebrate, you know, the kid from Rub Bank. So, yeah. Uh, that's so, and that's going to be open in person for people to visit. So. Um, it'll be up for a few months, so if anybody wants to drive down to Red Bank and check it out, uh, you know what? I may I may do that myself. I got to get down the shore more often than, uh, and that's pretty much on the way. I think I'll make my way out there. Um, but you say it's going to be open to the public? Yeah, and it's going to be like physically open. 
um, I guess they'll have limited capacity. I'm not really sure how they're going to do it. But, I uh, imagine you, you'd have to make a reservation and there are specific times. That's the way things have been going lately because of these crazy times that we're living in right now. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever think that uh, we'd be going through something like this? No. And I just wish it would stop. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. Okay, we've had enough. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Wouldn't that be terrific? We could just stop the pandemic. Yeah, really. You know, just exit the program. <laughs> it's not like it's on a holodeck or something like that where you just walk out and go, oh, it's, everything's fine. Everything's fine. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's really terrible um, and sad and tragic. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to think about everything that's gone on and all the people who've been lost. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, they keep e e equating it or comparing it to various wars and how many people we've lost in those wars. And it's definitely surpassed uh, the fatality rate has uh, definitely surpassed so many, uh, so many of the wars. And I found that absolutely amazing. So, but you're doing your part, right? You're staying safe? Yes. Six feet apart? Yes. Masks, For masks For come part, yes. when necessary? Yeah, which kind of mask, which kind of mask are you using? The the, the uh, safety mask or the um, the gator mask, which isn't I find. Um, I have, yeah, I don't have a gator mask, but at the start, I actually sewed some masks because I know how to sew. And so I I thought it was kind of a fun project, and hmm. um, now I'm also Rutgers provided us with some masks for which I'm very grateful, and I've been wearing those, and then. Sometimes I wear the disposable kind, but I try not to because I think they're bad for the environment. No, oh, you're very, very environmentally conscious. I un I've known that. About, I noticed that about you. Oh no, the light just went off. That's okay. I still see you, but I hear you. I hear you just fine. You're back on. <laughs> oh, oh, you're you're. In. <laughs> now I know the room you're in. I've, well, I I know it's your office because if you don't move in your office, the lights go out. I go off. The lights go yeah, off. It's been 20 minutes, so I guess the lights are <laughs> need a break. You got to move a little bit. But uh, oh, what was my question now? What was I saying? We were talking about masks. Yeah, well, talking about masks, and you're you're being very environmentally environmentally conscious, and I admire that about you because I am not, and um, somebody's got to somebody's got to pick up the slack. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, you know, I'm real worried about the planet in the future because climate change is real and it's getting worse and humans are really bad at, at changing course unless there's an immediate consequence. Mm -hmm. and because there's no immediate consequence to our actions. We're not changing fast enough. Right. And I, I really worry about what's going to happen yeah. for, in the future, especially. People need the immediate reward or immediate consequence in order to do something about it. And uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, um, the um, the way we care about the planet, we may not see it tomorrow. We may, we may not see what happens about it next year. But again, future generations down the down the way are going are gonna to see it. So uh, we really need to do something about it. So um, I'll start taking a little bit of examples from you and uh, trying to do my part more um using water bottles and not the, just going out and buying the plastic ones all the time yeah plastic is really bad for the environment you know they found like minuscule plastic particles in the snow on the top of the mountains in the rocky mountains because it, it's actually airborne now oh it, it never breaks down it just it, it becomes smaller and smaller particles but it's never mm -hmm. it's a long time for it to kind of disintegrate into mm -hmm. Another material, um, and I so have, it's, it's pretty much polluting the whole planet now. Yeah. So any plastic reduction you can undertake is well. Is, I I have to have my coffee in the morning, and I use the um, single serve. Yeah. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> um, but I use the disposable ones, and um, because of the convenience of it, yeah, that's it, and. Uh, I know it's it's not the way to it's not the way to think, but uh, I I like the convenience of it. So well, I'll tell you a secret. I've used those little pods myself, so <laughs> you're in good company. It's okay, Mark. It's okay. All right, so I'm getting away with it. Um, 
So, uh, aside from working at work, I know you gotta, you still gotta eat at work. As uh, have you been frequenting any of the uh, local establishments that we have down there? Our friends at Roberts. Much. I've really been trying not to eat out because I'm afraid of catching coronavirus, and I think. Lim just limiting the places you go is a really good way of limiting your risk. So mm -hmm. I've eaten at a couple places. Like I got some halal guys the other day. It was pretty okay. good. Yeah. I felt like eating some kind of, you know, comfort food. So I went there. Um, and I got I, not too long ago, I went to Sabor Unido, the Brazilian place in the Ironbound and got takeout there. Oh, OK. That place is delicious. Yeah. I mean, I love to like say like you know, mm -hmm. say that Sabor Unido is delicious. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> it's just a personal opinion. It doesn't represent anything official. No, 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 no. You like what you like. You're eating, you know, you got to eat too. But, you but mostly I've been cooking. I, cooking? Mm -hmm. Cooking at home? Cooking at, uh, at work? I mean, well. Not cooking at work. Cooking at home and bringing leftovers. Yeah? Yeah. What's a, what's a favorite dish? <laughs> I don't know. I make a lot of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, you make more um, healthier foods, obviously. And uh, unlike me, who's still munching on this hot dog here. Eating your hot dog. Hot dogs are delicious. I'm not, I understand. It's okay. Okay. I uh, a hot dog not too long ago, actually. But, again, uh, it's convenience because I was in a rush. Yep. So one of the things that I make that I think is really good is uh, I'm, I make a tofu stir fry. Yeah. Everybody thinks like, oh, tofu is so gross. But the way that I cook it, it takes a little extra preparation. But if you if you prepare it right, it's actually delicious. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, I, I'll have to take your word for that because I'm not a tofu. I'm not a tofu fan. <laughs> so you've never had my tofu. How would you know? I I never have had your tofu, but now I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Well, so, in the future, when the pandemic is over, I will I will share some. Some Elizabeth special tofu with you. Elizabeth special tofu. Okay, I'll look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, on a on a personal note, I uh, and if I if it's okay talking about this right now, um, new house for you. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> In this time. Day and age, buying a new house, huh? How is that? Uh... Well, the rates are terrific, um, you know, and I got a really great interest rate. And right now, I mean, everything's moving forward. I'm under contract and I'm supposed to close like in, I don't know, a month and a half or something like that. Okay. So we'll see. It's looking good, but it's very nerve wracking because. Because it's, you know, it's a huge investment. It's, it's a huge, huge investment. Tracking. Yes, yes. Taking, taking it from somebody who's only done it once. And I don't know if I ever want to do it again. But, um, yeah, it's got to be nerve-wracking. And wait till you have to move everything uh, from one place to another. And then start yeah. filling it up. And then start maintaining it. Yeah. The maintenance is, is one of the things that I'm really mm -hmm. like, not looking forward to. <laughs> I just got a, I just got a visitor come in with us over here. So. Is, that your, is that your new dog? Yes. You want to see him? Yeah. Come here, Simon. Come here. Come over here. Simon. Come here. I got to Hold on one second. Let me go get him. <laughs> oh, come here. Oh gosh. Oh. oh, look at Simon. What a cute. He's big. Oh, there he is. What a cute dog. He's adorable. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Simon is sheep doodle. And he's, how old are you now? Four months, I think. 16 weeks. And he's about 35 pounds. <laughs> oh, he's going to be huge. Yes, he's going to be a big boy. He's going to be a big boy. He can't sit on my lap much longer, so let me get him down. <laughs> Go over there. Sit. Well, it's nice to meet your new dog. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is the best thing that's happened during this whole pandemic. I had to do something positive, so I went out. And got the kind of dog that I've always actually wanted. I wanted an old English you, know, you and everybody else I'm friends with on Facebook. Yep. Yep. So lots of new dogs out there this time. Lots of new dogs age. out there. Yeah, we, we we threw around names and he was gonna be named COVID. <laughs> you know, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have something to remember this whole year by. 
But um, anyway, we're 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 coming up on uh, the end of our time here already because it's it's that time again. Um, time to move on. But Elizabeth, always always good to see you. Well, Mark, always... it has been a pleasure. I always enjoy our conversations. I always enjoy your conversations. I'm, I I hope that we'll be able to do it very very soon in person. Uh, or just come into my office, have a seat, and we can we can talk for hours. I can ask to borrow a screwdriver like I usually do. Oh, uh, screwdrivers, pretzel rods, whatever. I mean, Adriana's got the pretzel rods, and and, and uh, Krista now too with the pretzel rods. But um, screwdrivers or whatever you need, and uh, just even just to come in and sit down and and have a talk. Yeah, I look forward to that. Okay. All, all right, right Mark. Elizabeth. We'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Nice to talk to you. You too. Take care. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. And that's our show for today. Be sure to join us for future podcasts. Friend us, follow us, check us out on... Check us... Whatever you do. <laughs> Friend us, follow us, check us out. Follow and share us on Facebook and Instagram and elsewhere on the web. Hashtag undisclosed locations. For further information, contact me. Mark Papiani at papiani at rutgers.edu. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll speak with you again from another undisclosed location. <laughs>